Hi, Anne. Well, uh, welcome to. I'd like to welcome you to Blogging Heads. I'm Anne Altas, and you're Annie Gottlieb. Yes, uh, I'm also an Anne, actually, originally. Yes, yes. Yeah. So uh, it's the it's sort of the Anne show. Yeah. The Anne and Annie show. We'll have to think of a title for this. I think so, it's the uh, Anne and Annie. Well, you were my cho- uh, Bob and Nikki had been, um, uh, you know, goading me or not goading me, but trying to get me to uh, pick someone who I actually wanted to talk to. Um, and bring someone in from the outside, and, and you were my first choice because I thought we'd be able to have a great conversation for reasons that I believe based on reading your blog. Well, I feel that way reading yours all the time. You know, in fact, I sometimes email you behind the scenes because I can't, I can't contain myself. So, so <laughs> well, tell good. us a little about yourself so that viewers will know why I'm so excited about talking about you. Well, I've been a freelance writer. I've actually been a writer pretty much all my life since I was able to pick up a pencil. Um, but I was actually a blogger waiting to happen. I've yeah. always kind of been a frustrated columnist, you know. I always wanted mm-hmm. a place where I could just sort of empty out my head and say all the, you know, marginalia that I was writing on everything. Yeah. Tell hey, me. you know, did you know marginalia was my original name for my blog? I did not. Yeah. I didn't yeah. know. If you look at my first blog post, you can see uh, I originally called the blog uh, Marginalia, and Marginalia was an idea that I had for a novel. It was gonna be, I was going to call Madison Marginalia. It was going to oh be the goodness. name of the town. Cool. <laughs> I like the idea of the name of a town. That's good. Yeah, for an it academic sounds like time. a place name, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. So, uh, but but you've been uh, doing freelance uh, writing for a long time. Right. How, how, how has it been uh, putting together a career of all freelance writing? Well, what has that been like? now I'm doing freelance editing because uh-huh. I'm taking care of a disabled spouse. And so you have a very interesting situation with your husband. Why don't you tell people about yeah, that? Yeah, blogging really is my the way I get out. Uh-huh. Um, I haven't had much help until now. He's... Uh, Escaped from a Soviet prison camp when he was a teenager. And what year was that? That was 1947. He was taken prisoner in 1945 at the age of 16. So he was 16, and where yeah. was he? He was in, in the Donbass, which is in Ukraine. Uh huh. Someone read his book and then thought that he escaped from Siberia and crawled to Paris. Everybody thinks if you're in prison in Russia, it's Siberia. But uh-huh. uh, no, he was in the Ukraine. Uh-huh. And... Um, it was really just the Soviets taking over Romania, where he lived, and, and feeling like they had a right to take slave labor, anybody mm-hmm. that looked strong enough to work. So bottom line, he was buried in a cave-in, got uh-huh. gangrene in his legs, and escaped mm-hmm. in the middle of winter to avoid having them amputated. And then he became a pro- So he escaped with uh, broken legs. And well, they weren't broken, but they were sort of crushed, and they uh-huh. became infected, and they swelled up horribly, and it was really gr- it's gruesome. And... Um, he heard that they might amputate, and he escaped to save his legs, which he succeeded in doing. Wow. And he then became a heavyweight boxer, got into this country from Canada as a heavyweight fighter, mm-hmm. and you really need legs for that. So, mm-hmm. um, But like most people who've had a hard time in their youth, he's sort of paying for it again. He's mm-hmm. got a neurological illness that may well come from being hit in the head, like Muhammad Ali's Parkinson's. Oh, really? Yeah. Nobody knows really why he has it. So he doesn't have Alzheimer's. He has right. some kind of a a brain. Uh, right. It's a movement. They call it a movement disorder with some dementia. Uh huh. So you know they really don't know what it is. And so you you blog and you freelance, write and edit right. while taking care of him full time. Really. I really started to restrict myself to editing because um, writing demands a kind of concentration that you don't have. Uh-huh. when somebody can call on you any minute for whatever basic need. But blocking is a way of writing without having to have a real block of time where you can be sort of, um, you know, broken up into bits. You got it. It's perfect. I mean, yeah. it's really the perfect array of things. I can blog and I can edit for a living, and it, it works out very well. Because all those things are interruptible. Yeah. You know? I've often thought that blogging would be uh, is very useful to people who, who are invalids or who have some kind of a reason why they can't yeah. get out and... You know, to feel connected to the world through um, through blogging or through commenting on other people's blogs is something uh, that would be very valuable to people with medical problems. You know, Ronnie Bennett's Time Goes By, what it's really like to get older. Is that a blog yeah. you know? Yeah. And she has a whole list of elder bloggers who are, mm-hmm. are, are connecting with the world in a whole new way because yeah. of blogging. Yeah. It kind of makes getting old uh, less uh, frightening to think that you can remain connected to everybody and that you, yeah. you don't get shut in in the end. Until you get on blogging heads and the camera is actually showing how old you are. Otherwise, nobody might ever know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I bet you look great. I've got, all these, great. I've got all these young male blog friends. It's very uh-huh. interesting. It's almost like... I, I think there are a lot of young men who are interested in the older women, don't you? Uh... Th- 
They're interested in my mind, certainly. Um, I, don't, I don't know whether they'd be interested in my person in any other way than that. But older women are really kind of body, you know. We, we really have, we're like honorary guys. You know, we have nothing to lose, nothing to gain, and nothing to hide, is sort of how I put it. And uh, as a result, you know, we really can be down and dirty with them about all the stuff that younger women would go, ooh, you know, at. <laughs> right. Well, there's less, there's less to lose. Yeah. I mean, I think when you're a younger woman, you look at men and you think of them as representing a whole um, big relationship that will take you through a long period of your life, that right. will have an economic component and all of that. Right. I think when you're older, uh, you're more living day to day, and it's sort of uh, more about, you know, who can... You know, who can you have a relationship with in, in, that, in the moment? There's not as much at stake, absolutely. But, you know, when you're really young, you think that you live for today, you live in the moment, and that uh, the old people will be sort of very stodgy and, and, and less willing to, to uh, you know, do things. Uh, and the reverse, the reverse turns out to be true. Yeah. You know, and it makes me think, when I say that, it reminds me of an old 60s song. And I know you wrote a book about uh, uh, the 60s yeah. that is uh, named after one of my favorite 60s songs. So the 60s song that it reminds me of. That makes me think of being young and think that this was what it like was like to be young was a uh, uh, sha la 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 live for today. You know that song. <laughs> sha la 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 live for today, yeah, right? Yeah, so yeah. You know that song. Um, and I, I really had that feeling when I was young that young people live for today and old people were were um, stodgy and <laughs> never uh, and, and didn't care about the day. But really, I think it's it, there are a lot of benefits to being older, and part of it is that you you know you value the individual segments of time in a in a different kind of way, you don't have to plan so much. Um, but you wrote a book that I wanted to ask you about. Uh, Do you believe in magic? Yeah. That, I assume it's named after the Love and Spoonful song. It is. And actually, that was the publisher's choice, not me. I think I wanted to call it What's That Sound? <laughs> I looked up some reviews of the book, yeah. and I saw somebody knocked it as an unfortunate title or something like that. Yeah, well... Why it, didn't they like the title? It was not my choice. Well, because it was so... Actually, the book was sappy enough to have that title, though. I'm, I'm not terribly proud of it at this distance in time. It was 20 years ago. Oh, yeah, so you don't like the book. Well, so when you wrote I the book, uh, you were as close to the yeah. 60s as we are now to that book. Right. It was the 80s. And I think that really my clock stopped when I met Jacques because he was so completely on another planet from my generation that I think my 60s clock stopped and my idealism was kind of frozen in amber. So when I got to the 80s, I was writing still this sort of rapturous, gushy stuff about how we, the, you know, 60s generation had a mission, and we were, you know, we were born at the same time as the bomb, and we were somehow supposed to either stop the bomb or some damn thing. And it was, it was very kind of new agey and starry-eyed, and I really got slammed for that, because so many of our generation were by that time becoming grown up, wised up, cynical, neoconservative, and I just... You know, kids, uh, my kids were young in the 80s. I have two yeah. sons that, that were born in the very early 80s, and they got very interested in the, the 60s. They were interested in the 60s music and the Beatles, and, you know, I think there was sort of a trend to rediscover the 60s a little bit in the 80s. I think perennially there is. There probably is again now, and I think it's one of the reasons people want to get an anti-Iraq war movement going, because they really... It's nostalgia. It sounded like so much fun having that anti-war movement going. I mean, yeah. fun is maybe the wrong word to use because yeah. it felt very serious and passionate, but it was intense. It was, you know, it seemed important. It seemed epochal, world-shaking, you know? Yeah, yeah. It seemed, we, we felt very important maybe because there were so many of us. Yeah, oh, you know, I was going to ask you about, you may, in that book, what I was reading some, I haven't read the book, but I read, was reading some reviews of yeah. it, but I, I saw that you made a distinction between first wave and second wave baby boomers. Honey, I was going to bring that up with you, because... Because that distinguishes us. Exactly, yeah. exactly, and to me the difference is, you're cool and we're not. I, I'm on the... The first well, wave, the first wave, which I consider to be like 1946 to 50 or 51, right. mm -hmm. is... No, don't say 51 or you'll... All right, okay, 50. I, I'm <laughs> you'll put me in the wrong way. Okay, no, hard. I think 50 is right. I think yeah. I think that's what I said originally. I've right. forgotten. But. Right, I really identified with it. Right, and it's, um, you know, we're earnest, we are sentimental, we're spiritual, we're seekers, you know, and all that stuff. Uh -huh. And you guys are coming after us, are skeptical and cool and, you know, punk rocky and, you know... Definitely. Much I less sentimental, <laughs> much less, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I, I remember growing up when rock and roll in the 50s was first coming out. I mean, I remember when Elvis came out and when Elvis seemed sort of like just a funny joke yeah. of the sort of day. 
and and you know so I remember all of that stuff and my and my sister was in the first wave group that you're discussing and so I was so so my sister is square than I <laughs> was she got married young yeah. she you know she just and even all, all you know all my life I felt like I was sort of in a different generation from her even yeah. though I'm only uh, you know four years younger than she her. was born in forty six yeah forty seven forty seven. Forty-seven, yeah. Forty-six was me and Bill and George. You know, all the presidents and Sylvester Stallone. And, <laughs> uh, yeah, well, you know. you know, I was thinking, I saw this article in the New York Times on uh, Hillary Clinton when she was in college. Did you see that article? I, it was a, maybe about ten days ago or so. I didn't. My Times reading is very spotty and mostly confined to the weekends. Well, it had a picture of her um, when she was in college. Um, and uh, what, what Was she wearing her? a headband? No, she was wearing these amazing uh, striped pants that, uh, anyway, they, they looked, but, but it was just before, I think it was, she graduated just, I think, as I was going into college. Uh -huh. And I remember looking at her and reading about her um, and the sort of uh, type of person that was in college. Oh, oh, here she, here she is. Uh, it was in 1969. She was a student at Wellesley. Uh, she's wearing these striped pants. I'll link to it in the sidebar, but uh, she looks very earnest, uh -huh. and she looks like the kind of person who could grow up and, uh, you know, run for president. But, uh, you know, she is also some, the sort of person I don't quite identify with. I went to college in uh, 1969, so she is just that, that earlier wave, and I was interested in, yeah. like, this distinction between the sort of more serious, squarer boomers yeah. and the sort of later ones who were more, uh, I have to say, the word hippies. I wouldn't say that we were squarer. I would say that we were more earnest. Uh -huh. You know, it's we were not square. We did a lot of drugs, and all, but it was all very spiritual. One of the big distinctions I made was between, you know, the difference between taking LSD to, you know, be one with the universe and taking it to have a good time and have, and have some laughs. Uh, but see, I put know. myself in the older group, though. Uh -huh. I mean, I remember the group that, you know, listened to Timothy Leary yeah. and uh, listened to the sort of philosophy behind it as if it was really about... Uh, you know, getting onto a higher plane. You probably kind of have one foot in each, one toe in each water, you know, one foot in each camp, a little bit, yeah. yeah. No, and I think the, the, the people you're talking about are more like my younger brother's uh, generation where drugs and just became for, you know, becoming uh, dissolute, right. and uh, not to say anything against my brother, but, right. uh, you know, the idea of just, just having fun and right. uh, rock and rolling and, and so on. And just and being... Looked down on the, my people in my little sliver, I guess, uh, look down on those people as, um, you know, not, uh, not aspiring to... Uh, Higher things. Right, right. Higher things through drugs. Right. <laughs> I mean, that was Better living through chemistry, we used what? to say. Better living through chemistry. <laughs> but now, uh, one thing I wanted to raise was the subject of, um, you know, falling in love with political candidates. <sighs> And, um, you know, uh, I think you said something in your book about how, uh, you know, you're sort of marked for life by what's going on when you're about 17 years old. Yes. And, uh, you know, that would be for me when Bobby Kennedy died. <sighs> Um, and, you know, we're really coming up on the, uh, it's, I hate, it's amazing to think, but it's 40 years. You know, we're in a, uh, the election is going to be in 08, and the election in the 60s was in, in 60. You know, I hadn't, so we're up to I hadn't thought of that, but you're right. It is and that was the one that had Bobby Kennedy, right. and Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. I remember being very enthusiastic about politics and just very deeply affected when Bobby Kennedy died. Well, 17. And, uh, it's yeah. interesting to be around in, you know, an eight-year, in a presidential yeah. year, and to see people being in love with, you know, maybe Hillary or Obama. Is anybody in love with um, Hillary? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I guess, well, I think that we're, uh, there's an idea that women ought to be enthused in some special way because a woman is right. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that doesn't feel liberated to me. That just feels reactive. You know, I mean, I think li to be liberated is to be able to go for the best candidate, in your opinion, male or female. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, I find I can't get enthused at all at the idea that a, a woman is the front runner. Just, it would depend on who the woman was entirely. Yeah. You know, I'm thrilled. One thing that I think young women really don't get that I wish they could get is how thrilling it is still for somebody my age. Whenever I hear the astronaut, he or she, you know, the senator, he or she, you know, when newscasters began to have to start saying that, as, uh -huh. as much of a pain in the ass as politically correct language is, just the fact that they had to say that, it still gives me goosebumps. I will never get over that. Because when I was a little girl, you could be a wife and mother, you could be a teacher, a librarian, a nurse, you know, or a beautician. 
pretty much. Well, I certainly remember growing up in the 50s and, and uh, hearing that, you know, you could either be, what was your, your decision was you could be a mother or a career One gal. One or, that was, yes. You remember the, the expression career gal? And to yes. me, career gal, I had a very distinct image, I think it was from the movies or TV that I had about that, that uh, was basically a secretary. Yeah. Yes, right. But, you know, you could also be a teacher or yeah. a nurse. But I really, or an some, either some nurturing or some sort of help meet kind of profession, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that was it. Yeah. And yeah. so yeah. I'm still, so it's a dual thing with me because I'm not excited about Hillary. And I, I'm not impatient to have a woman president if we've got to have, you know, if we can't have a woman we like as a, as a, yeah. as a, as a candidate. Well, I also don't like the idea of a woman who is, got where she is through a man. No kidding. Good point. You know. Good point. Or, and who perhaps was the, the marionette operator behind the man in a sense yeah yeah that's yeah. that's very much the old way of doing things yes it's like uh i hope you can't hear the sound effects where i am i that someone just walked by my door and blew them <laughs> <laughs> that's on the, well, if that comes out on the video that makes it lifelike right <laughs> <laughs> I really am here in my Maybe office. it was a raspberry for, for Hillary or something. <laughs> yeah, no, it was, and I don't think they know I'm on here. Anyway, I'm in Madison, Wisconsin. You're, you're I'm in Chapel Hill, Hillary. North Carolina, another you're university town. And, and uh, but you used to live in New York City. Why are you in Chapel Hill? Uh, because of Jacques, because of his disability, and the fact that uh, we have a young, strong friend here who's sort of like an adopted son. In our, he's in our oh. karate organization. And I've known for a long time that this was where we would come because of that guy and because of the fact that the karate organization is like what a church would be for us. It's our... So karate is sort of a community for it you, is. like a religion? It's like a spiritual community. I wouldn't say religion because there isn't a whole, you know, there's not a lot of dogma. It's just, you know, the Holy Communion is you work out together and you sweat together and anybody anybody can do it and so so are you interested in this subject of sort of religion substitutes oh substitutes <laughs> by by which you mean what i mean do you mean the sort of well things that people put in their life in the place that would be occupied like environmentalism <laughs> yeah like politics yeah. or you know or yeah. you know sports well sports listen sports baseball seem to have a bit of a religious quality to them don't they spiritual more than religious because there's really no dogma that comes with it it's a practice so it's more like mm -hmm. meditation. It's more sort of Buddhist, you know, non... But that's a, yeah. I mean, a religion could Yeah, it could. It could. My brother, who is the only practicing Jew, really, in my family, although one of my uh -huh. sisters is sort of going that way, um, is his other religion is baseball. I mean, literally, he writes, he blogs about them. His, his blog is called True Ancestor, Nepotistic Pitch. And he... He writes about religion, about baseball, as if it was literally his second religion and has pretty much equal status with Judaism, and so when the high holidays and the, and the you know, World Series come at the same time, and the White Sox are in the World Series, it's a big problem. <laughs> well, you should put a link to the blog up in the sidebar so people can I'll see what that. you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> I'll try um, to find a well, I that. wanted to talk, can I go back to the subject of uh, Hillary yes, Clinton definitely. and the uh, sort of, uh, well, 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 and uh, the sort of a woman and the man yeah. in, in politics. Yeah. Um, I, I was watching, um, I was watching, I don't really watch the Oprah show, but... Um, I was wondering about that when you told me that you were... Do I watch... I TiVo yeah. it, and I see what's yeah. on, and I sometimes watch it because I want to blog about it. So, I'm, actually, there are a lot of things I do only in order to blog about them or because I don't really enjoy them per se, but I enjoy them by blogging Been about there, them. Been there, done that. <laughs> what? Been there, done that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But um, I, I was interested in... Uh, in the story of uh, Jim McGreevy, the governor that uh, resigned uh, in New Jersey, saying, I'm a gay American, yes. but really he I'm a gay some American, corruption. please. Yeah. yeah. And he wrote a book, and his wife, Dina Matos McGreevy, also wrote a book. Mm -hmm. And they sort of have this public, um, really kind of divorce proceeding or child custody concern, but they've both written mm -hmm. books, and her book just came out, and, and she was on Oprah. Dueling um, books, yeah. His yeah, I mean, it's, it's sort of like marriage through books on open. Yeah, in public. It's all being fought out in public. Yeah, what do you think it of that? It has to be horrible for their kids. Just horribly embarrassing. Yeah, I was connecting it in my head to uh, this, this story with uh, Alec Baldwin recently. Yeah, really. who, uh, who got his, um, who has a dispute over his child, his 11-year-old child, yeah. uh, with his former wife, um, oh, what the heck is her name? Kim Basinger. 
Kim Basinger. Yeah. I remember that. I can picture her. Yeah, I know that happens to me a lot. This time I happen to have it. You know, but, uh, um, you'll do the same for me, I'm sure. But he, he left a phone message uh, basically insulting her for not answering the phone. His ch- insulting and, his and, daughter and calling her a pig, yeah. Yeah, thoughtless pig, yeah. and of course she, and it goes on and on, and he sounds very angry, and of course somehow that got put up on the web, and everyone will be listening to that forever. And it's really his wife, that, his ex-wife that he's angry at, not not so much the child. I mean, the child sounds like she's become a football, being kicked well, back and forth looked, between them. Yeah, yeah. That, that's so, like, And then he went on The View to talk about that. So there's a whole kind of a thing of sort of husbands and wives yeah. and also media going public with your story, either with books or phone messages that get onto the web, mm-hmm. and then going on these sort of women's TV shows to kind of process that. You know, yes. the McGreevy's on Oprah, and then uh, Baldwin goes on The View. To it's, like grie- it's like grief, ca- national grief counseling or something. Yeah. I just, yeah. I really think that, you know, that the voyeurism of that bothers me, and it, and it also doesn't really interest me very much. I know it fascinates people, and I, I just, I, I get turned off, and I turn it off, you know? Well, it's, people used to feel guilty to be voyeurs. Yeah, yeah. Why, why'd yeah. that go away? Yeah, I know. It's, now it's almost as if you don't exist unless the camera's looking at you. You know, it's as if the camera validates or reifies your existence in some way. Yeah, we say into the camera. We say into the camera. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> right. I mean, here we are proving our own point. But I also, I want to know if you think, I have this feeling that our generation generally have been terrible parents, but I want to say that it's always except for the ones you know. The ones you know, like in your own family, are always seem to be wonderful parents, but the ones that you hear about and read about seem to be terrible parents. Totally. Well, the reason why you can't, say you think you're a bad parent, you think someone is a bad parent, is that you're implicitly saying you think the child came out badly. And so then you're insulting the child. Well, it's more like the parents of our generation. We didn't want to give up being the ones in the spotlight. You know, we really were in the spotlight from such an early age. Here's this wonderful big generation that's the first this and the first that and Mm -hmm. the Davy Crockett coonskin caps and the hula hoops and all of that. And we just don't want, didn't want to give it up. And it seems to me that a lot of people, that our whole style of parenting, you know, our, I don't have kids, so I'm excusing myself, I guess. <laughs> God knows what I would have done to them. But um, that we went on living our own lives and fulfilling our own desires and yeah. our rather addictive desires in many cases, you know, and the rush, the, the beginning rush of love and not the sort of later responsible plotting stages of it. But... And so, you know, you can say that, uh, I guess you could make an argument that that made our kids see life more realistically and grow up to be more mature. But don't you think that there was also this boomer phenomenon of the kids as extensions of your own oh, family, yeah. where you wanted them, just yeah. like in the old days, I guess, you wanted them to achieve, or you, uh, your self-worth was uh, expressed through them. Totally. And that's a dangerous uh, investment to make. Right, and I think we used to accuse our parents of that, didn't we? Yeah. You know, like, let me be myself, and then what do yeah. we do but turn around and do the same thing in another, in a hipper form, probably. Or, I mean, I would have just done anything yeah. to, um, you know, disappoint my parents. <laughs> <laughs> but then we sort of wanted to be friends with our kids. Yeah, my, you know, I was thinking about that the other day. My parents did had absolutely no idea whatsoever of that kind. They never did anything that was about... Uh, being friends or thought about, uh, you know, thought about themselves in that way at all. Yeah. It just wasn't done. Yeah. I mean, there was a real clear sense of distinct roles. And, and adults parents. seem so much more adult than Yeah, right? <laughs> I know. And when I, I remember, speaking of, like, images of what I would be like as a woman yeah. that I had when I was growing up, you know, around, like, late 50s, early 60s, I had this picture of, you know, the kind of person I would become when I hit maybe just even the age 21. Yeah. And I have this picture. And, and you've never gotten the funny there, thing right? Is the picture is exactly the TV Lois Lane. Yeah. Remember, yeah. That Superman? Remember how Lois Lane dressed when she was at being the reporter in the uh, news office? And she had like a nice, neat suit and a little hat mm-hmm. and a neat hairdo. And she had a very sort of precise, uh, sort of adult manner. Mm-hmm. And I felt like, you know, by the time you're 21, you'll be like that and mm-hmm. you'll stay like that for the rest of your life. One of my lines to my, which I put in my book, which I said to my dad was, do you remember Lauren McCall in To Have and Have Not? Uh-huh. She was 19 years old, and yeah. she was older than I'll ever be. <laughs> right, yeah. right, yeah. right. Well, I so know. many of those images were shattered by the 60s, I mean, which I like about them, actually. 
Did you? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I Do you remember I, that there was a book? I, I think it was, um, it was one of the early feminist collections, and it was a paperback. And mm-hmm. I don't remember what it was called. Uh-huh. But it had a split screen picture on the front, and it was two pictures of the same woman, two halves uh-huh. of her face. And one half she had shiny lip gloss, and her hair was terribly well done, and she looked kind of pale and, and suppressed. And then the other one, her hair was wild and free, and she had like no makeup and probably right. no bra. She just looked, she was laughing with joy, you know. Right. That kind of shattering yeah. of, of, of images that seemed a bit too neat, you know, was, was kind of a nice thing. Well, yeah, there was this whole idea back then, and I think to some extent it got embedded in the culture and lasted, that, uh, you know, by sort of changing your appearance and stopping wearing makeup or stopping uh, controlling your hair and so on would make you free and would make the world beautiful. And, you know, I mean, that was sort of the hippie uh, dream. But it was supposed to be an expression of something from within. You know, now it would be a style change because now we really see... Yeah, people might affect it as just a style now. Yeah, exactly. But then it meant something. But then it like came, it was this explosion from within, you know, it really was, because I remember that constrained, kind of pale, wan, you know, feeling of, of just total self-doubt and, and, and double bind as a woman, sort of not knowing which way to turn. But th- this is sort of like the thing about drugs, though. There wasn't it's kind of a d- delusion of the 60s baby boomers that very actually superficial things that we were doing actually had deep uh, meaning. Or do you think they really did have deep meaning? I think that, you know, that whole time to me seems much more interior than now. Mm-hmm. In other words, I experienced everything as, as experiential and deep and, you know, not a matter of surfaces and not a matter of appearances back then. Mm-hmm. You know, there were all those small presses and there was poetry and there were mm-hmm. intense discussions and there was... I thought a lot more of it was about what you were experiencing than how you looked or what you did, kind of. You know, that there was much more focus on the sort of inner life, and that sort of evaporated. You know, even psychotherapy is now about taking Prozac and, and doing behavioral yeah, modification, you know. Yeah. I mean, back, back in the day when people actually took Freud seriously and believed in Freud, there were a lot of deep discussions that came along with that. I mean, even if it was all phony, even yeah. if it was all wrong, yeah. it at least had depth. Yeah, and <laughs> even after Freud, that depth persisted for a while, you know. Yeah. I, th- that's one thing I miss about that time, is the sort of sense of the vastness of inner life compared to surface life. Well, let me uh, move up a topic that I was going to put uh, out of order and, and talk about this uh, sex and diet thing. <laughs> you know, I mean, speaking about things that are frivolous, I found it very, um, uh, you know, depressing to read about the... And people got excited about, oh, is this just a great idea that these uh, doctors or, or scientists in uh, Scotland were working... Well, they're still working at these sort of rat level on this uh, hormone or something like that, but supposedly the drug, um, uh, this pill, it's sort of like, well, isn't this the perfect pill? The pill would, uh, for women, it would be for women, yeah. women let women take the pill right. as usual, uh, that uh, it would increase their sex drive, uh-huh. they'd want to have sex, and it would also make, the, it would also work as a diet pill, so they'd get thin, and they'd want a lot of sex. I suspect, so that, I suspect I just, they're just getting thin because they want a lot of sex. I mean, Wait, say that again? I think they're just getting thin because they want a lot of sex. I don't well, think like it's a dual relax. action at all. I think it's like, you know, when you, didn't, didn't you always lose weight when you were in love? You know? No, I mean, I, I <laughs> think you can lose weight by being absorbed in anything yeah. that keeps you from eating. I mean, I, I got it so absorbed in, in blogging, I used to, like, not Forget stop to eat. To eat. Uh-huh. I mean, anything that you're really into could keep you from, uh, from, from eating. Yeah, but so it's, sex is such a primal pleasure. It sort of trades off with eating. So when you're really infatuated. I think you lose weight anyway. So probably that's my take on it was that that was just what it was doing. You know, but I had this real problem with the idea of people wanting this drug, this idea that you would take a drug to make you want different things or that you would want to want different things and you would take a drug to yeah. make you yourself want different things. Yeah, the things that, that, the things that you, you should thin, want. Uh, yeah. You would take the drug and then you would get all of these other effects, and then everyone would be happy. Yeah. I mean, who, what's to object to? It just yeah. seemed to me like the most uh, shallow approach to human life. Well, it's like listening. Did you ever read Listening to Prozac, that book by Peter uh, yeah, Kramer, yeah, yeah, yeah. about how people were using antidepressants to change their personalities? You had to become scintillating. To become there was a whole idea that it would make you a better person, and why wouldn't you want to do that? You'd become extroverted. If you were a yeah. shy person, you'd always had social anxiety. You would now become outgoing. And, mm-hmm. you know, I 
a lot of my teenage nieces and nephews were on those drugs, I discovered, and I was sort of shocked. And I realized that, you know, I was a depressed teenager. I think most teenagers are depressed, actually. Uh -huh. I would have been put on those things. And who would I be now, you know? Right. I mean, so much of who I am now has to do with having cl clawed my way out of that, you know, with my bare hands, <laughs> kind of. And so then you develop some skills. You actually develop an inner life and so on. But if you just do everything with a pill. Right. I mean, it's, it's a whole different way of being to me. It's, it's, it is, you know, people engineering themselves like they do with cosmetic surgery. Yeah, I mean, you know? to go back to another si 60s uh, cultural reference, it reminds me of some Twilight Zone episodes. <gasps> yes. Like, you mm -hmm. remember the one with the girl? What was it called? Number something looks just like you. What was the number? I don't this remember the number because you're the one who told me about that. Number, maybe episode. it's number 12. Maybe it's like, let's assume it's number 12. Number yeah. 12 looks just like you. Yeah. It was a, a, it was an idea that at a certain age all women would go through this operation where then they would they would select one of uh, various models. You'd pick this beautiful model that you wanted to look like. And, of course, you would go through the procedure, and then you would end up looking like this, um, you know, beautiful model. And this one woman didn't want to do it. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. force her they would it. force her to do it. Yes. Yeah, well. And I think in the end, if I can spoil it, I think in the end they convince her and she goes through with it and she's completely happy. With oh, the no. <laughs> and so the punchline is, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. it was great. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's pro that was prophetic, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, I mean, I think even the fact that there was the Twilight Zone back then. Yeah. Is there anything equivalent to that now that, you know, sort of challenges... Um, the cultural norms and it's still great to go back and watch those black and white Twilight yeah. Zone episodes when they have a marathon on TV Land or yeah. something. At least we can still get to them. Yeah, I used my sister and I used to watch that. She's she's the one that's your age, and she would watch it with her hands over her eyes, and I would have to tell her what was happening. <laughs> so, um. Wow. Well, yeah. Let's see. So. Well, um, baby boomer parents. I really want to come back. Yeah, to go that. back to that. I. I've become a sort of, I've become to a certain extent an anti-baby boomer, baby boomer. Uh -huh. And I suspect my own motives for becoming that. I sort of think maybe I'm just pandering to younger people or something and, that, you know, betraying my own. But I really, I really, um, and part of it was just doing that book and having it get so slammed and having it not be very successful and then, you know, for that reason, turning against the whole thing. I mean, I'm very clear about my motives, but... I've really, um, you know, I used to think we were kind of, I don't know if you can say this on blogging heads, are we bleeped? We, I thought we thought we were kind of hot shit, and uh -huh. I have come to think that we're just like every other generation, and possibly worse. Well, there was worse. so much narcissism involved, yeah. and when we, were, when we were young, sort of like thinking that you're wonderful is one thing, but then when it comes... <laughs> It becomes embedded in the culture. Yes. Uh, and when yes. younger people come along, of course, they're going to express all kinds of hostility against you. And since they're younger, they're going to look better as they say it, and you're going to eventually be an old fart. <laughs> and, uh, if you're, you're still, like, uh, basking in this self-love, yes. it's, it's just not going to be pretty anymore. The movie Speed, remember that? Did you see yeah. that? Do you remember how the, the Neo, it's not Neo, but it's the same guy who played Neo. Yeah, Keanu Reeves. The Keanu Reeves character. There you go, supplying a name for me. Um, and the um, Dennis Hopper character. It was so much about how, you know, Generation X loathed the baby boomers. It just cracked me up. That was the whole subtext yeah. of the movie. Yeah. You know, it was these mad old geezers who were, you know, trying to ruin everything for younger people. <laughs> it was, um, but I kind of, you know, I kind of see the point because I just read an article in some North Carolina paper about a woman mm -hmm. who'd, She'd married a Jordanian guy when she was young, and she'd had three husbands, and the Jordanian husband had been involved with cocaine, and he'd taken the three girls back to Jordan, and then she went on, and had, she herself had a crack and a crank problem, and now she's got her daughters back with the help of the State Department, and they're grown up, and they're all happy to be reunited, and she has a boyfriend who's a rapper who's like 30, 20 years younger than her, and I'm just going like, oh, please, you know, the, the drama that... The dramas that we put, we, again, I say, you know, present company accepted, put our kids through, you know, really because of wanting to be the kids ourselves. Yeah. yeah. And I just think, you know, the McGreevy and the Alec Baldwin, I, I actually looked McGreevy up to see if he was a baby boomer, and he was. Yeah. He was born in 1957, so they kind of span it, you know. And I don't know that this is, that we invented this. I mean, I don't think we invented nasty divorces where the yeah. child is used as a football. But I think that all that kind of thing 
We just didn't feel any, as a generation, we didn't feel any compunction about that, about putting ourselves first. I think there was a real embarrassment before our generation about getting divorced at all um, or having a, an affair in the relationship. Like, neither side would talk about right. it. You just didn't want the shame. Even if you were miserable in your marriage, and certainly, yeah. God knows, staying in a miserable marriage doesn't do anything for anybody, kids included. Yeah. But what, well, you know, what's a miserable marriage? Then you get into definitions, and that's yeah. kind of interesting. Well, I, I thought it was interesting with uh, Dina McGreevy on, on Oprah yesterday that she was, uh, actually, it was really just a this very bizarre show because I've never seen Oprah really reveal that she couldn't, I think she revealed that she couldn't stand the other person and that she was on <gasps> Jim McGreevy's side. <sighs> Because she kind of let uh, Dina McGreevy kind of box herself into a corner, expressing all kinds of uh, bitterness and and uh, and making uh, Jim look bad. And, and then in the end, Oprah w uh, sort of crisply said to her, yeah, well, we talked to Jim, and here's what he said about you. And then he said something completely magnanimous. Oh, oh dear God. And she just looked like, oh, she's the bitter one, she's yeah. the bad one. And she had tried, she d attempted to use the whole show to present herself a as, as the... Uh, as the injured the victim, victim the yeah. good one. <sighs> so Oprah sort of... present him as completely manipulative, that he had married her yeah. for political purposes and all of yeah. this stuff. And then Oprah sort Oprah was just expressing all of this disbelief to her. For example, she kept showing these pictures of Dina smiling as she was standing next to Jim on the day when he announced that, uh, you know, he had had this affair with a man. Yeah. And Dina was smiling in all the pictures, right. and Oprah just couldn't stop saying, why were you smiling? Why were you smiling? As if, you know, you must... And, and you could see that her side of it must be, you really were in on this as a political game, and you knew all along. Uh -huh. And you were uh -huh. in it for yourself. Uh -huh. Now, she didn't come right out and say it, but I, yeah. I felt that that's what she thought. Very hostile of her. She doesn't usually do that. Yeah. I think she was sort of uh, trying to invite the audience to sort of, uh, you know, you kind of feel along with her. She's yes. able to express herself in a way where yeah. you feel like, that's the right thing to feel. Right. She's speaking like... Speaking of a drug. Conducting. <laughs> yeah, speaking yeah. of drugs and telling you what to feel. It's as if she's sort Good of a drug. Point. Yeah. But uh, um, I wanted to talk about... Wait, you had a, you had an article about women carrying purses. Yes. And you also mentioned bralis. Yes. So these are two sort of hippie things I wanted to talk about yes. because I went through a long period of my life where I just wouldn't carry a purse and considered it like you know, a feminist issue that women had to stop carrying purses <laughs> and women had to stop wearing bras mm -hmm. and that both carrying a purse and wearing a bra uh, were like, um, you know, were part of the oppression of women. So you were and a hippie. Was, uh, you were a hippie. It wasn't just a matter of comfort or style yeah. or anything like that, but it was a deep it was ideology. political issue. Yeah. So if you don't carry a purse and you don't wear a bra, where do you put your stuff? You have to have pockets. <laughs> and this was another yeah. feminist issue right. for me. The clothes must have pockets. And men's clothes have pockets. Women cl women's clothes don't have pockets. This is a plot to oppress women. So I still kind of think the whole business about having a smooth silhouette, which is why women's clothes right. don't have pockets, is yeah, that I is that know. part of the oppression too? Should we not care about our silhouettes? Right, and you know, there's some men who wish they could carry a purse because they don't want a bulky wallet messing up yes. their silhouette. Uh huh. But I really thought that the that it was a, a political issue that pockets were required. <laughs> I, I could have been convinced to go into business and devote my life to the production of women's clothes <laughs> that had the appropriate pockets so that women would not have to carry a handbag. It could even have a Freudian um, subtext like, like a kangaroo's pouch or something, right? <laughs> I mean, it wouldn't have to be masculine. There's nothing masculine about a pocket. It goes in. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe we ought to shame men out of having pockets. <laughs> are you saying that men's pockets are like vaginas and that men are <laughs> have... Is that what you're saying? <laughs> no. Actually, no. I'm just thinking that women could, you know, women could take them on without feeling that they were being masculine. Yeah, yeah. Fishing vests, you know, with all those pockets on the outside. I love, you know, cargo pants. I love pockets. I wish you had developed that line. Yeah, and then the, the style is you have to put the pockets in a place where it would be flattering. You can't just put them, you know, you have to know it, and you have to sew them in right. There'd be like a whole science of getting the pockets right. Yes. I think this would be a great feminist uh, business. You know, you ought to do that. You really ought to do that. <laughs> you want to go into business and introduce the uh, perfect uh, pocket the, pants? The old house pocket. <laughs> Yeah, you know, that's a theme in The Color Purple, at least in the movie. I read the book, but I don't remember it. The whole uh, creating special pants that would liberate women. I don't remember that about it. I didn't well, like that. You told me you had a story about brawlessness that was good. So. This is my, yeah, I, I was kind of a hippie wannabe, but I never got any further than that because I was sort of too serious and, you know, the uptight kind of first wave thing. 
but I, in, I was wearing a kind of Indian print sack dress, and mm-hmm. the one I time, the yeah. one time I tried to go, I tried going braless. And honey, like I'm a 36 C, and you don't go braless, you know. Did you, have, did you, you don't, do the pencil test? Uh, <laughs> you know the pencil test? Yes. Yeah, I would definitely have retained the pencil, I'm sure. But oh, uh, I should just say for viewers who don't know, the pencil test was to see if you could go braless. You would put a pencil underneath your breast, and if it would, and then you know let go, and if it fell, you could go braless. But if it stuck under there, you know you couldn't. You weren't supposed to go. Braless. I did not know about the pencil test in time for it to <laughs> save me from this mortification. I was walking somewhere on the Upper East Side of New York where I worked with no bra on, and a policeman approached me in full uniform. You know the belt, the guns, the whole bit. Like, you know, high noon. And as he approached, he looked directly at my chest and he said, The Cannonball Express. <laughs> oh my God. Which I now think is hilarious. I mean, I tend to think that all of the old sexist language about women being broads and frails and, you know, all that stuff, I love that stuff. I think it's very poetic, actually. And I now think that him saying that to me is hysterically funny. At the time, I was, but he was mortified. A- he, why was, I mean, it seems wrong for a government authority <laughs> to tell a citizen, when well, you weren't committing any crimes. I thought you were going to say that he was going to warn you that you were going to get sexually assaulted. Uh, he just, you know, what, what would now on a campus be considered verbally sexual assault, sexually assaulted me. I mean, he just, you know, and it was, I just think it's terribly funny. <laughs> The Cannonball Express. I mean, apparently there was a lot of movement. Well, that was in a there. movie. That was the name of a movie. Yes, yeah. it was. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I never, was... never, literally never went bra- braless again in public ever. I was life. absolutely devoted to brawlessness to the point where I uh, had a plan to. This was before I went to law school, but I had a plan to like actually characterize feminism as a religion, and that I needed to not wear a bra in order to. Uh, uh, <laughs> To have the free exercise of my religion, if you know, if an, if an employer were to say yeah. you can't uh, dress like that, yeah. I was going to insist on it. You know, like you, you know, like a Jew might say, you have to wear a yarmulke. Wow! I was going to claim. Uh, I. When you look back on that, I was that devoted to it. When you look back on that, what do you think of it? What do I think of myself? Thinking yeah. things like that. Yeah. I think I had a lot of ideas about law that wouldn't. Uh, I didn't realize you had to that there were cases and that. Um, you couldn't just claim whatever you wanted to be the answer uh-huh. and have that be law. But I used to imagine that I could. Uh-huh. Um, and also, I was pretty sanctimonious about uh, just things that I personally wanted. Uh-huh. I, I had a ten, and I, maybe this is a boomer tendency or a youthful tendency to characterize whatever it was that I wanted as if it was, you know, a very deep, um, profound. Uh, you know, principled matter was to like reframe it as something of deep principle. But I think that's kind of the impulse to be religious. Wow. I see why you brought up the subject of substitutes for religion. Uh huh. Well, like feminism, I thought was. This was that one of your reasons for going into law. Was feminism a motive for you? Uh, as it may have been for Hillary Clinton. For all of I I just went into law because I. Why did I go into law? Because you were an artist who didn't know what else to do? I was an artist and I felt like a failure. Yeah. And I also felt, st- because I was a visual artist, but I have a certain amount of sort of verbal orientation. You can I say that again. <laughs> yeah. I felt starved of the verbal. Like, one, there was a period when I was um, an artist where I just taught myself Italian in my spare time and got very obsessed with it just because I could tell I was I just had a hunger for language. Mm-hmm. And so um, and that's a law one. just seemed like an entry point. And law is also something that you can do with any background. Mm-hmm. I mean, I had a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree, and, you know, I hadn't studied the right subjects. But the fact is, they'll let you go to law school with any kind of a background. I knew other artists who, after they got exhausted with struggling to make a living as artists, went to law school. Yeah. And a lot Why of musicians you? go to law school. Uh-huh. Because yeah. Yeah. you can earn a living that way. I mean, it's sort of like what editing yeah. is to me. You can salvage any kind of a misspent youth by going to law school. <laughs> if I hope I'm not leading anyone astray by saying this, but yeah. you can come from any back. A lot of people, you know, a lot of people who really want to go to law school will think, i got to take the pre-law courses. Yeah. and uh, But there is no yeah. such thing. Not Just true. Just take whatever you want. Be interested in whatever you're interested in. Yeah. 
And then when all else fails, you, you can go to law school. But you might not like it, so yeah. don't just do it. It's a penitential. I would think it, the, the, the years in law school must be somewhat like purgatory, you know, in between. Oh, I love being a law student. You school. did? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I came back to be a law professor. It's uh -huh. like being a law student forever. That's true. Yeah. Perpetual student. But, hey, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, to go back to this subject of the handbag, you yeah. showed me an article from uh, written by Lynn Yeager at The Atlantic, right. reviewing a book about handbags, right. the whole issue of handbags as a deep subject. Yes. I noticed that she quoted Germaine Greer, one of my original favorite feminine, uh, you know, one of the first hardback book I ever bought was The Female uh -huh. Union. To buy a hardback was like uh -huh. a big uh, investment in those days. I think it cost five ninety five. dollars It's so, like renting an apartment in New York. Yeah. That cost $85. Yeah. So, uh, Jermaine Greer, this is in the Lynn Yeager piece in the Atlantic, said uh, that shouldering luggage that is an ancient female habit born of servitude. <laughs> and so this uh, connected to this idea for me of uh, carrying a hand, women carrying a handbag. It's part of uh, oppression. oppression. Somehow part of our, uh, as, as oppressive or in some way constraining or... It meant you couldn't swing your arms freely when you walked. Maybe it was part of yeah. walking like, yeah. properly. Yeah. And that, uh, the idea that being a woman also required you to have all this special equipment. I mean, why did you need a hand? What was all that? What was right. in there? What was all that? Why do you need your war paint? I mean, yeah. in some societies, maybe men had pouches, little pouches with their war paint in it. Yeah. You know. Or, or weapons. Yeah. I thought, I really think, I had a flash one day that carrying a purse goes back to being a hunter-gatherer and carrying a, a carrying pouch, a gathering yeah. pouch. Yeah. And that yeah. that's why, you know, I feel so so wrong without it. You know, like, where's my purse? I really feel like I have sort of phantom limb if I don't have my purse on. So did you always carry a purse? You didn't go through a no purse for me phase? Uh, not that I can remember. I went. I didn't wear a watch. My sort of hippie thing was not, I didn't wear a watch for uh, years. I knew someone who wouldn't wear one. And I'm back to not wearing a watch, mainly because I don't have one, a, a decent watch. Well, I could wearing a watch just because a cell phone it has the time on it. So That's right, so you don't need to. Your, exactly. Why would you strap something to your body right. if you didn't have to? But you were, you were a serious feminist. I mean, you were... I'd love to talk about, you know, what feminism meant and did for you and for me. Because I, it's very different now, and I, you know, I think a lot, of, a lot of what it did for you and me is now completely embedded and absorbed and taken for granted. Yeah, well, yeah. I went through a number of phases. I went through a really hardcore phase at, at different points. You know, I could sort of graph where I've been with respect to feminism that would really sort of change a lot. Sort of go around, if but I around could really the figure it out, I could write a memoir that would, you know, there are points when I, like, connected up with the feminists and then diverged, you know, and I've done yes. that at lots of different points in my life. Uh -huh. But I was yeah. into the sort of Germaine Greer phase. Yes. Um, and then I started to s associate it with sort of older, squarer women uh -huh. who basically just wanted to enter the marketplace and get conventional jobs, uh -huh. and that diverged from my sort of hippie artist um, self-conception, and I, I, yeah. then I, I, I kind of disaggregated from that. I remember when Ms. Magazine first came out, yes. and that turned me off uh -huh. to feminism because I felt like, well, these are just middle-class women who want conventional uh -huh. um, economic success. There were the ones who wanted that, and then there were the sort of hardcore ideologue kind of harridans who... Who, yeah, who just, I was into that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was into, you know, it, turning the whole world upside down. Uh -huh. I thought that was a good idea. Well, I think we kind of did, though, you know, in a, in a surprise. Yeah, but in a constrained, yeah. a modest way. Yeah, yeah. I still want to get you to read my friend Dalma Hines' books, because I think they're among the most subversive, quietly, books ever written, and they're, they're about affairs. And they're about, oh, they're about the sort of, about that. they're about, the, her books are about the sort of oppressiveness of marriage, which is not coming from men, it's coming from a sort of archetype of marriage that haunts, has haunted women and possessed them. So you're saying the liberation is in affairs? No, she was saying that marriage, that this sort of spirit of marriage past would possess mm -hmm. women, even hip young women when they got married. Their skirts would get longer, they'd become better behaved, they'd sort of mm -hmm. start watching what their husbands ate. And that this was like being possessed by a demon, um, which was the, the sort of angel of the house image of marriage that came into being with the Industrial Revolution when the workplace separated from the home. And she writes about how, you know, women who had affairs 
did it because it wasn't that the affair was the liberation. It was that they had come to feel so suffocated by this image that they put on when they got married, when they became wives. And it wasn't the husband's fault. And the husband might like to have the free spirit that he married back to. Um, and that often women who had affairs burst that shell and rediscovered themselves and then in some cases came back to their marriages and busted up, you know, busted them up and reformed them and made them more comfortable to wear, kind of. So, I really um, think you would so love So it's her not anti-marriage. I mean, I thought it was going to get to the point where, and I think it's very hard to sell women on this, but maybe I thought it was a good idea uh, to be very anti-marriage. At one point. And to see marriage yeah. as, uh, you know, yeah. just... Um, the sacrifice of liberation for women. Dalma is more like if, you know, it's women who are walking out of marriage, don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Something like 60% of the breakups of marriages are initiated by the woman. Mm -hmm. Young women, four to seven years after getting married. And she uh -huh. says, if you want to save marriage, make it hospitable to women. If, if women, you know, like the army, I mean, she says it's a patriarchal institution like the army, like the church, you know. If you yep. want to save marriage, make it comfortable and hospitable and welcoming to women. But uh, Put pleasure I mean, for women in marriage if you want The it. way marriage is presented in our culture is that it's the women who want it and the men have to be tempted into it. This is why her books are so subversive. Yeah. You've got to read these books. You would love them. I mean, I, I, I'll send them to you. Yeah, okay. I mean, I really kind of agree with this point that I, I think that there's, a, you know, this serious problem, which is that uh, marriage is set up for men on the theory that men are the ones who don't want it, but then... But men are the ones who thrive in it. Men, men are the ones who thrive. They There's like thrive. a marriage problem. And one of the problems I have with these feminists today that I get into fights with is I just don't think that they're being critical of, you know, the, these sort of fundamental institutions. Uh-huh. You know, that uh -huh. it's, it, it's become the more conventional set of, you know, economic... Um, uh, concerns that turned me off to Ms. Magazine many years ago. Well, another thing that, that gets to me about some of the young feminists is this sort of hyper-sexualized, hyper-feminine, you know... Sex positive. Yes, yeah, so-called sex positive, right. I don't, I don't like that. Yeah, I don't like... I like sex, feminine. I like, you know, I like attractiveness, but yeah. I think that that whole, you know, sort of getting into the sort of almost prostitution-like get up and, yeah. and and calling that it is sure it's power of a sort but it's a very kind of s and m um power interesting image. Yeah. you know and it reminds me of this sex diet pill issue <laughs> which is that the idea is well we're not gonna we're not gonna look behind a certain assumption we're gonna assume sex must be the positive thing so we won't yeah. look behind it we won't criticize it because that's sort of a fixed point and right. everything else has to be arranged around it so you must be strong on that point and then uh you know, all the other ideas have to fit with that rather than questioning it. Yes, and those women often seem to me to be playing this sort of double game where they're mm -hmm. both being like men uh -huh. and being like what men want at the same time. And it seems to me to be sexually satisfied, you ought to be doing what you want. That's so what's that if missing. You're not questioning, if you're not talking about what you really want and what's good for you, uh, why are you just being positive about sex? Why aren't you opening that up and questioning it? Right. Um, and, and actually becoming convinced that that's what you want, rather than assuming it, being a sex-positive feminist, or taking a drug for it. <laughs> taking a drug for fix it. it and, and then you don't question that one thing that should be right at the very center of what you should question. The point that you have to take a drug to want it is very yeah. revealing. I mean, that sort of indicates that you've forgotten how to want it, how to simply want it. Or you're afraid to ask whether you want it. Yes, and you're posing this role, and then it has to be filled with sort of artificial feelings. Yeah. You know, pumped yeah. full of, like, silicone emotions. Yeah. You know? Agreed. And, and I think that, you know, one of the things that disappointed me about the way that both, both sex-positive and sex-negative feminism went, you know, one was the sort of hairy-legged, we-don't-care-how-we-look <laughs> way, which I didn't want to go, and the other was this sort of let's tart ourselves up and you know, fill this this sort of conventionally um, playboy penthouse image with, you know, power. Mm -hmm. And neither of those, I'm always, you know, the reason I call my blog Ambiva Blog is because I'm always looking for the third way. I'm never satisfied with the two options that this culture is offering me, never. And in the case of feminism, I was looking for a style of attractiveness that came from within and that was individual and that, mm -hmm. that arose from pleasure rather than from performance, you know. Yeah, Again, it's that whole thing of missing the inner life, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Well, speaking of which, uh, let's talk about prostitutes. Yeah, fine with me. <laughs> so there's this uh, character, what's her name? Uh, Deborah... Palfrey. Uh, Palfrey. Deborah Jean Palfrey, yeah. and she's accused of being a running a sex ring in Washington, and supposedly she has uh, 10,000 to 15,000 phone numbers, including those of some pretty... Uh, High up shots. people, which... And she's handed them over to ABC. Yes, and it's, and it's sweeps week. And they're doing a 2020 about it on Friday. How ah, how did this happen to cool. coincide with sweeps week? Does anybody guess? So what do, what do you think about all of this? Oh, I, mean, I think There's it's, some talk about, because there was this one guy, Randall Tobias, who yes. resigned, and he had some connection to the Bush administration, was overseeing AIDS relief and promoted abstinence. And, a, and, and took an anti-prostitution pledge, which right. was forcing organizations they gave money to 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 take this anti-prostitution pledge right. which was preventing them from giving condoms to sex workers and right so there was a hypocrite oh. in amongst the 15,000 phone numbers oh my god and so people who don't like the bush administration or don't like social conservatives are, yeah. are gloating about this but meanwhile uh isn't there a larger issue here about uh how we should think about prostitutes and how we should um well, you know, this is one of those places where we're just not going to disagree because to me it's kind of a big yawn. You know, it's like who will stop the rain, right? Yeah. I just, yeah. I don't know how you could make that go away. You uh -huh. know, I mean, if people were all mature and fulfilled and they, you know, learn to express, men learn to express their sexuality through love and relationships and all that stuff that women have always wished they would, fine. You know, some can, some do, wonderful. But I don't think they ever all will all the time. And I think there's always going to be that. And I don't well, know how it should be regulated. I don't really know. Right, you know. Well, I think one thing that could change is just to, you know, to legalize it. I mean, it seems to me the government getting involved in the fact that people are um, paying for sex is like the government, you know, it's, it's between uh, the man and uh, the woman. Consenting and relationship. adults. Yeah. If the guy is having sex with someone else, whether he's paying for it or not, whatever it is, it's the same as if the guy is a jerk or something like that. Imagine if the government, uh, you know, came after the guys for, for being mean or yeah. for being uh, selfish. Well, I guess you could look at it like a drug, and it's the same issue. In a sense, it's the same issue as drugs. Yeah. And, you know, the question of whether harm is done to people, to women, yeah. and whether it's damaged women who get into it in the first place, yeah. who get into it because something's been done to them early in life, that, yeah. or whether they're just putting themselves through college, you know, by doing something other than being a, <laughs> a secretary. It's a tough. It's a tough question. I I don't care for the glorification of it. I don't like the glorification of porn and the sort of yeah. trendiness of it. I find basically find most porn pretty boring. Um, but but the uh, question would then be, uh, let's make it really boring. <laughs> if you want to do away with it, make it really. It's a, it's an addiction. You know, it's a, it is a drug. If it was less off limits, uh, would it become more boring? I think when things become less, one of the problems is when things become less off limits, the limits get have to be pushed further and further, and things get more and more extreme because yeah. people have a need to transgress. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons for prudery is that it's so much fun to transgress it, and yeah. if you set those uh -huh. limits close in, like the so social so, well, so maybe we should make more things illegal because then uh, people will be able to transgress without doing that much harm. I have wondered whether hypocrites don't have more fun. You know, I had this argument yeah. with a social conservative friend of mine, a guy that I helped, actually helped to put together a book. Mm -hmm. His name is Jeffrey Schwartz, and he's a big neuroplasticity guy. And he wrote a book that was actually a series of letters to Judith Regan's son, an older man advising a, a young boy. Judith Regan published it, and the letters were to her son. And I just helped make it book bookish. And um, I, it was he was a tremendous influence on me. He really got me out of being of thinking like a conventional liberal. He opened my eyes to a lot of things. And one of the things he said, you know, we had this argument about hypocrisy. Is it worse to be a Democrat and to say, well, I never crusaded against prostitution and all that in the first place, so I'm a better person than someone who crusaded against it and then availed himself of it, you know? And what Jeff quoted to me was, hypocrisy is the tribute that vice pays to virtue, which is La Rochefoucauld or some French, of course a French. Uh, and I, I thought, heard Justice Scalia say that once. Yeah, he quoted it. And I thought about that and I thought, I wonder, you know, what, what's that about? I mean... Is it better to at least pretend? Is it better to pretend to be good and then let people be dis completely disillusioned? That you, sh 
The way, or is it better to grow up and be a little bit French? You it's know, not and just Justice Scalia used it. He was talking about constitutional interpretation. Of course, he believes in interpreting the Constitution consistent with the uh, the original meaning of the document rather than to just make it mean what you want it to uh-huh. mean. And that it, when he concedes that maybe sometimes uh, someone who's doing uh, original meaning interpretation, they may end up saying that that meaning um, really is what... They may cheat, right? So yes. it may be uh, that they're putting into it what they really want to be the answer. Yes. Uh, but at least they're ashamed of it. At least <laughs> they, they've taken a position whereby when they stray, they can be called hypocrites. Yes. They can be called on it, and they're ashamed. Yes. Whereas the people that develop the other theory and say, well, I believe in the notion of a living constitution, I actually mm-hmm. can infuse present-day uh, values into the interpretation those people can do it with no shame. With no shame. Uh, so it, it's kind of the same thing. If you say, uh, so I can see how it works in this in the sexual context. Yes. That, that's sort of similar. If you say you have all of these values, it doesn't mean you're never going to sin. Yes. It just means that you still have shame in your life, and so when you are a hypocrite, people can call you a hypocrite. Uh, but those people who have redefined the terms so that they can never be called a hypocrite because they can do anything. Yes. Uh, they shouldn't be gloating. They should be ashamed. That's exactly that's exactly the difference. Yeah. Like, is it really so great not to be a hypocrite if it means that you have no standards to speak of? Yeah, I mean, uh, you can immunize yourself against hypocrisy. But I suspect that the people who have shame and who know they're doing a bad thing are also having more fun. Because it's more fun to do a bad thing. Well, I mean, that's the thing about sex is, it's, uh, there's a Woody <laughs> Allen line, something like that, you know, is sex dirty? Yeah. Uh, it is if you're doing it right. <laughs> right? Is that one of those? I think so. I didn't know it was Woody Allen, but I think well, that's I mean, Well, maybe this is the problem. Instead of this, the, the sex pill, what we need is to uh, r- bring back shame. And, and, uh, wow, what a great, what an idea. What a then, then it would be dirty again and be fun. Yes, and, and bring back, you know, a certain amount of concealment, you know. <laughs> you heard that the Japanese found the back of a woman's neck in a kimono incredibly sexy, <laughs> as the Victorians found an ankle, right? Yeah, this reminds me of back in the, well, my grandmother used to say to me back in the 60s, you know, I was one of these, uh, I was the first girl in my school to wear a miniskirt, and I was always, I was always, every week I was uh, redoing the hems, and I was always getting the one that would get in trouble, and I can remember at the time, you know, my grandmother taking the position that this doesn't leave anything to the imagination. <laughs> yes. That was always yeah. the line. Right. Of course, I mocked that. Right. right, right. But maybe that was. Maybe she was right. What do you think? Yeah. Well, you know, there, the, there is the return to modesty school of thought, the social yeah. conservatives. I'm, as, as usual, I want a third way. I mean, I really think people thrive uh-huh. best in a, mo- in, a, in a moral temperate zone as well as a, yeah. as well as a weather temperate zone. You know? Yeah, I was just flashing on some terrible image. I mean, you could say that the real sort of uh, fundamentalists, like in Iran or whatever, covering up all the parts of a woman's yes. body and so on, that they were actually making sex sexy again. Well, and they're going a little the, too far. I mean, it's sort of like they brown bag their women, we shrink wrap ours, <laughs> you know, and neither of them is yeah. quite ideal. Yeah, they're, yeah, you know? I think we do need something in the middle. <laughs> yeah. Ours are like, you know, fruit on display in uh, saran wrap or something. And they're both oppressive to women, both extremes are oppressive to women. Right, because they both focus attention on the fact that she's a physical woman and on, mm-hmm. on her body, which either needs to be displayed or to be covered up, and you never get a chance to just be. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's a whole interesting thing about women bloggers and women yeah. bloggers getting attacked on sexual terms. You know, it's sort of like, yeah. if you're a woman, are you ever allowed to forget that you're a woman yeah. and just sort of be a mind or be a, a spirit or a being, you know, engaged yeah, in a conversation? Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, I've noticed in the little controversies that I've had recently that a lot of people seem to have this idea that women can't attack, or that if a woman is doing the attack, or if a woman is being attacked, or if a woman is attacking a woman, it's, it, it, it's different. It's in some others, oh, you, you right. attacked a woman, or a woman right. attacked a woman. Right. And then they immediately uh, you know, start talking about it in terms of it being a cat fight, or right. female jealousy, right. or they can't see it as a normal one person is attacking another person, or somebody's being... It has to have that uh, sex component. Right, and and then that's a self-fulfilling prophecy because often women are attacked for their appearance or, you know, I mean, that, that that's the jugular that people go for when they're attacking a woman. Yeah. I mean, yeah, well, one, well, yeah, I don't know if this picture of us are going to be comments, and you'll see if the comments are about the way we yeah, look. Yeah, they probably will be. They I mean, probably will be. when <laughs> David Horowitz reviewed my 60s book, and he was already a neocon there, so he uh-huh. predictably hated it. Uh-huh. And one of the things he said in the review was that my author photo looked older than my age. 
You know, it was sort of like he couldn't stop with attacking my ideas, which I think is completely legitimate. And even if I looked older than my age, so what? What does that have to do with anything? You know, it had it certainly didn't strengthen his argument against my ideas. In yeah. fact, I thought it made him look kind of silly. Yeah. But there, there you have it, and we may, you know, for all I know, people will be saying the same thing. Although, you have to say, we did talk about women's topics. We were very womany. We did, and, you know, one, one of the things that, the dual thing that feminism did for me was it made women's topics respectably, hu you know, humanly interesting. Right, and, yeah. and human topics accessible to women. And, and this comes back to my idea that the, the sort of shallow things are deep and the idea that they really, I mean, yeah. feminism was, a lot of it was about talking about some really superficial things as if they had deep meaning. Uh -huh. And they really seem to. I uh -huh. think that they do. Uh-huh. Well, I think they, they represent and symbolize an enormous amount. Yeah, I mean, I, sometimes I get criticized as a blogger for talking about frivolous things or for writing about Oh, God. Them. But I think that's where all the really interesting... Uh, that's what... That's those uh, are the ones that get the most comments, you yeah. may notice. You know, 192 or whatever. Yeah. I'm getting a lot of comments about purses. <laughs> you know, it's a subject people just... Purses mean something. Well, this is the great thing about blogging. You can, yeah. you know, you can mix it all up the way you do yeah. in your head. Yeah. Or in your purse. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's just a jumble in there. It's it all tells. crumpled tissues and uh, right. old tea bags. Right. <laughs> well, we've gone over an hour. We, we, we've we done it. I haven't even looked at the clock. So. No, I just looked at the clock. We've okay. gone over an hour. We can say we've done a dialogue. We could keep going, you know. I could keep going. So to be <laughs> it's continued. It's my last day of class here at the University of Wisconsin Law School, and I have a class at 1.20 Central Time. Uh-oh. So time not Central go. Time, so yes. I have over an hour, but... Uh, okay. But uh, you know, I could keep going. But I'm thinking about I'm thinking yeah. about habeas corpus and the death penalty and federal courts and the like, rather than handbags and yeah. uh, bras and all of that stuff, which would be more fun to talk about. And I have to turn into a pumpkin like Cinderella and go back to being a caregiver. Yeah. 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 So it's been wonderful, and um, yeah, this has been great. I am happy to meet you. I'm happy to meet you too. Okay. It was great talking to you. You too. Okay. Okay. Take bye care. Bye.